Well, welcome back to the second day of the Ginny May 2019 Summit. I am so pleased to see everyone here again for what we think is a fantastic morning lineup. Uh, and we're going to kick it off with Brian Montgomery. I'd like to take a second to introduce him. Brian serves as the Acting Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. He manages the day-to-day -day operations of the agency and advises Secretary Carson. He also serves as the Assistant Secretary for Housing and FHA Commissioner for HUD. Nominated by President Trump in September 2017, his confirmation marks the first time an individual has served as the head of the FHA twice and under three different administrations. Commissioner Montgomery is responsible for the management of FHA's $1.3 trillion mortgage insurance portfolio. This includes single family, multifamily, and the healthcare programs. As we like to say at HUD, we're very appreciative that Brian's willing to do multiple jobs for one paycheck. As a Texas native, he holds a, a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Houston, and he also attended UT Austin. I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Brian Montgomery. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here with you uh, today. I just returned late last night from uh, Puerto Rico, so it's very good to be using English once again, so thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity this morning to provide an update on what we're doing at FHA, specifically to enhance our performance, uh, to make the agency stronger, and to increase our effectiveness in serving our core mission. Uh, I also want to recognize my colleagues from Jenny May who are here, uh, who put this conference together. Uh, we have a tremendous relationship. It's a pleasure to work with all of you at HUD and, and get your advice and insight. For those of you who don't know, Marin has literally been spanning the globe of late. She's been to Hong Kong, to the Middle East, talking up the Jenny May product. So she gets to fly internationally. I get to go to Toledo, Ohio, Manhattan, Kansas, and elsewhere. Uh, I do also want to recognize some of my FHA HUD colleagues that you'll be hearing from soon. Uh, specifically, my number two, uh, the General Deputy Assistant Secretary John Garvin, who's with us. Uh, Giselle Roger, who's our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Single Family Housing. Uh, Keith Becker, our Chief Risk Officer, and Dror Oppenheimer, who's a Senior Advisor to the uh, Commissioner. Uh, Giselle has been at the helm of the Office of Single Family Housing for almost two years. Uh, her uh, knowledge of FHA and our policy process is outstanding, and she's helped lead that effort to bring about meaningful reform at FHA. Uh, Keith joined us in October from Freddie Mac. Uh, he was there over 25 years, and he's leading our team, and his experience around actuarial modeling and uh, data analytics has made that fantastic team even better. <clears throat> and Dror uh, joined us from uh, Fannie Mae. He'd spent uh, over 30 years there, so he brings enormous insight on the GSEs and where we can better align with them as well. So getting back to Jenny May, perhaps one of the most uh, important relationships in the housing finance arena within the United States, although it's little known outside the investment and housing community, <clears throat> is a partnership that exists between FHA and Jenny May. Now, while the lion's share of our current uh, mortgage volume is handled by the two giants, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the work of FHA and Jenny May is enormous and no less important. As you know, FHA affects millions of families in the United States, representing hundreds of billions of dollars in Jenny May investments. Perhaps most importantly, FHA fulfills a critical mission for our country, ensuring a steady flow of funding for low to moderate income, minority and first-time home buyers, and helping to house elderly and vulnerable populations. The presence and execution of the programs of FHA, with Jenny May as their source of liquidity, instills continuity and competence in housing markets when those virtues come in short supply. That's that counter-cyclical role that is not always fully appreciated by some of those folks, policymakers, and legislators here in Washington. Now, understandably, the two of us tend to fly beneath the radar. However, the strength of, I like to call it the dynamic duo, is elevated, and our piloting skills felt uh, rather acutely 
if and when the U.S. economy occasionally stumbles or hits some turbulence. Indeed, our mutual mission was on display quite convincingly during the last financial crisis, when private lenders would have otherwise pulled back further. It was a testament to the credibility of our government's guarantee. But it also highlights that our stewardship of this unique responsibility cannot and should not be taken for granted. It means the diligent management of FHA's risk undertaken on behalf of American taxpayers must be paramount. It means it is important to understand and to remind ourselves of the whole picture, again, for policymakers on Capitol Hill, representatives of, indus of industry, and certainly, especially for myself and Marin, <clears throat> as our teams make decisions for the future. In short, it's not lost on either of us that the ability to securitize FHA's products is a reason that these loans exist at any meaningful volume. Everyone here obviously no doubt comprehends the significance of this, but I only highlight it because it might also forget this is, that this endeavor is funded by investors from all over the world, many of them who are here with us today. We understand that most investors look for predictable returns, and they also look for transparency to better forecast the future performance of these investments. We also understand that a strong secondary market for our product benefits lenders, homeowners, and FHA. And that's what Jenny May is for, and why that part of HUD has to work very hard to make sure that its securities are something that investors can analyze and price accurately. That is one of the reasons we are committed to ensuring the strong safety and soundness of FHA's programs. As you know, the finance system has a lot of moving parts, and they all need to keep working properly. Now, our program requirements at FHA need to make sense for lenders and servicers. They need to make sense for homeowners and taxpayers so that loans can be made to deserving borrowers and credit losses can be paid for by our insurance premiums. But since the government can fund all of these loans, they have to be turned into in securities attractive to investors. Rapid prepayment activity, for example, that doesn't seem to make sense can cause investors to lose confidence in the securities and put a lower price on them, and that is bad for our mission of keeping housing affordable. The more investors are willing to pay, ultimately the lower cost of financing for the borrowers. And there's also the importance of the TBA market, which is managed outside of the government, but is essential to keeping rates as low as possible. It is that ability to transact in securities that have not yet been issued that allows borrowers to lock in interest rates for free and lenders to avoid losing money when rates change while they are processing loan applications. Improved disaster loss mitigation policies are another example of program efficiencies that can benefit everyone involved and help us better manage our risk. The disasters of 2017 and 2018, including Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, Florence, and Michael, as well as the California wildfires, have been a learning experience for servicers, as you can imagine. As a result of that, uh, and it was a tough experience to get, but they did gain more meaningful experience and insight in how to make better use of relief, relief options and allocate the resources they control and where they are needed the most. It's incumbent upon the people making decisions about policy to be knowledgeable about all these different parts of the system, of the system and how important it is that they fit together and kept in balance. Now, almost everyone in this room has seen this end poorly for borrowers and for taxpayers and even for investors following the last decade's housing collapse. Now, we don't preserve the integrity of the assets that underlie our securities it will be exposed at the most inopportune time. Well, for FHA, this is an important time to make sure that we get it right. While the economic environment feels to be one of cautious optimism, we are at an important crossroads. We understand the need to step up to these challenges. And I've been focused on building the strongest team possible for housing and for FHA, upgrading our technology, and managing our risk. And these are all interrelated goals. Now, one of our biggest priorities at FHA has been to update our outdated technology. The catastrophic imbalance that currently exists between FHA and the rest of the market, including the GSEs, uh, can hurt traditional FHA borrowers in a number of ways and needlessly increase risk to the system. 
So we are very pleased when Congress recently appropriated $20 million for FHA's IT modernization plans. And by the way, we ultimately need about $80 million total. And I want to thank the organizations that gave input to Congress on the importance of updating our technology. In partnership with our new Chief Information Officer, David Chow, we are now in the process of developing a modern, single technology platform and baseline architecture. This transformation will serve borrowers more efficiently and effectively in a modern world of mortgage finance that is increasingly digital and paperless. The new technology platform will provide lenders with a single port to conduct business from loan application all the way to claims. It will include the ability to track requests throughout the life cycle of the loan. And it will enable, ultimately, electronic submission and document management to reduce errors and reliance on paper, as well as to enhance processing speed. The new streamlined housing IT systems will improve overall performance, data management, and production. Quite frankly, we couldn't be more excited about it. And the goal is to make it easier for quality firms, for good actors in the marketplace to do business with FHA, while not compromising our standards and ensuring lenders are held accountable. Indeed, one of the key, three key goals I've set for FHA has been to strengthen our capital by improving the quality of our counterparties. It is not divorced from the other two goals. In fact, it's integral, staying true to our core mission and managing risk diligently and appropriately. They're all part of the whole picture. Strengthening our capital will require providing clarity, consistency, and transparency to the market. It means FHA will need to ensure sustainable lending and endorsement practices and attracting the best lender partners who, di who directly affect the mission through our customers' access to quality credit. It means significantly improving FHA's outdated servicing policies, processes, and technology so that firms have greater clarity, consistency, and transparency. Now, Giselle, Keith, and Dror will expand upon this on the next panel. And given Dror's uh, Fannie Mae servicing experience, he is helping lead our internal efforts to bring around much needed reforms to our servicing protocol, protocols, including ways we can better align with the GSEs. But in short, for FHA to achieve sustainable ownership, ensure the liquidity of FHA loans, and protect taxpayers, we must ensure we can manage our non-performing loans and maintain prudent man uh, financial management of the mutual mortgage insurance fund. Our effort to strengthen lending practices, policies, and processes will impact both FHA and Ginnie Mae's counterparty risk, which permits HUD to sustain that mission over time. When both our 2017 and 2018 reports to Congress regarding the financial status of the MMI fund, we indicated our intention to enhance our enforcement regime to clarify the perceived severity of defects and other types of noncompliance. It's become widely known in a conclusion shared by both lenders and consumer advocates that our compliance rules continue to discourage many lenders, including depository banks, from doing business with FHA. The share of mortgages endorsed by depository institutions de decreased to 13.3% in FY 2018, which is significantly below the 44% in 2010, and this imbalance must change. Most depository institutions are no longer regularly doing business with the FHA, in large part due to risk association associated with our regulatory compliance and perceived litigation risks. In Q1 of FY19, for example, not one, not one of FHA's top 24 mortgage originators was a depository institution. They were all non-banks. Now, to be clear, Non-banks have worked diligently to fill the void and have been solid FHA partners, and I thank them for their participation in our program. However, I frequently said, and I will say it again today, and that is I don't take sides, but I strongly believe this lack of particip participation by banks has a direct impact on the availability of FHA products and consumer choice. It also impacts the diversity and strength of the counterparties that end up in Ginnie Mae pools. Now, our goal has been to identify areas where FHA can provide lenders with greater certainty, resulting in increased confidence to make FHA-insured mortgages available to eligible borrowers. 
Now, the result of that confidence should be greater competition in the market and more financing choice for borrowers, especially first time and minority home buyers. So in addition to modernizing our technology and analytics that will make FHA a more attractive business partner, we are evaluating other policies that will be helpful to good actors who want to participate in our programs. And we are working hard to provide greater clarity by providing more transparency throughout the enforcement process. We are working with the Department of Justice to review and address the use of the False Claim Act, which has been used to sue FHA lenders. And we've been working with the Justice Department since early last year. Our goal is to be fair. And to be fair, we believe FHA needs to be a true participant in that process, along with the Department of Justice. Well, last month, we also announced proposed revisions to our loan level and lender level certification requirements, as well as the framework of our loan quality assessment methodology, or defect taxonomy as we call it. The goal, again, is to provide needed clarity and transparency and to streamline the certification process and to ensure proper program oversight. Now, there, there are proposed changes, and particularly on the loan lo level certification, our goal is to make it logical, easy to read, and understandable, and eliminate duplicative information collected elsewhere. The proposed changes to our annual lender certifications are, are designed to better align them with the National Housing Act, while continuing to hold lenders accountable for compliance with HUD eligibility requirements. Defect Taxonomy Version 2 will update the defect taxonomy that was created in 2015 and implemented through the loan review system in 2017. Our proposed revisions will improve the structured categorization of defects with more consistent severity tier definitions, along with potential remedies that align each severity tier and revised sources and causes in each certain defect area. We'll also include new defect areas for servicing loan reviews and HUD policy references. Now, all three of these proposals are posted on FHA's single family drafting table. Now, we have been reviewing the comments and we look forward to getting more comments as we recently extended the uh, comment period to give people more time. In mid-March, we also announced adjustments to our total scorecard to better evaluate risk at the margins. The drivers have been uh, the drivers of that, rather, have been some of the measures I just mentioned, a steady deterioration in the endorsed book and what I would describe as unacceptable layers of, of risk layering. Well, with $1.2 trillion of single-family insurance in force, the situation requires that we balance our mission to help credit qualified borrowers who depend on us to reach their goals. And we balance that with the responsibility to maintain adequate claims paying capabilities. Policy actions taken in 23 established under the previous administration required stronger manual underwriting of loans with layered credit risks, specifically credit scores below 620 and debt to income ratios greater than 43%. Now, these were standards similar to those set by the Qualified Mortgage Underwriting Guidelines published by the CFPB as part of Dodd-Frank. However, in August of 2016, almost three years later, the previous administration removed the credit benefits from the total scorecard and did not replace them with any other risk management policies. The result has been a steady increase in higher risk loans being endorsed by FHA. That pattern has not abated and is what has been driving our changes to total. And we believe the adjustments made recently will be effective at managing risk and risk layering and we will monitor the outcomes of these changes to ensure that they have the desired effect. We also continue to monitor the credit quality of endorsements and will make policy changes as appropriate, again, balancing the mission and risk management. Again, the goal is to better evaluate risk at the margin so that lenders look at the credit variables in detail for these loans. Loans that go to manual underwriting are indications to the lender that they have a higher risk characteristics and will require more comprehensive underwriting. A preferred manual will mean there is a need to dig deeper into the quality of income and any other compensating factors, such as undocumented income and analysis of residual income. And I believe most everyone in this room is on the same page, that we expect lenders uh, who want to underwrite good loans for people who are ready to take on home ownership. 
Now, none of us want to contribute to something that is not sustainable for families and that could ultimately hurt them. We also recently reiterate our policies around down payment assistance, although we push back the effective date of the mortgagee letter. And we continue to look at cash out refinances and other factors that might be indicators of deteriorating credit quality. The last thing I will mention is our current energized efforts around housing finance reform. Obviously, the President's March 27th memorandum provided renewed focus on reform and directed HUD to develop plans that update our programs, including FHA and Ginny Mae. Secretary Carson and I hosted external group meetings to receive the input of a variety of stakeholders. We held at least 10 meetings with over 20 groups. In the process, we received many great insights and some very worthwhile and useful comments and suggestions. And you can expect that some of these will be incorporated into our document, uh, many for attribution. Now, one individual who I want to identify said something during one of the external meetings that really stuck with me and folks at FHA, and I suspect it will resonate with some of you. And that was, um, it seems like FHA is oftentimes more focused on process than they are outcomes. And I hope I don't see too many heads nodding yes in agreement. Uh, but my HUD colleagues are going to talk more about this during the next panel. But modernizing our servicing processes will make an enormous impact on the ability to do FHA uh, business with FHA. And we expect to be able to move to the next phase of this process sometime this summer. Well, again, I want to thank uh, all of you for being here today, including, uh, including many of our guests who came from, from overseas. Again, thank you for coming. The strength of our secondary market is absolutely vital to FHA and our abil ability to fulfill our mission. And we are doing everything possible to strengthen the agency and ensure that it is, in turn, a source of strength should it be needed, fulfilling its counter-cyclical role while continuing to serve first time low to moderate income and minority home buyers. Again, not losing sight that we are a market funded by investors all over the world. It is a source of strength and also reason to appreciate the complexities of that market. I would like to make one final request. I hope you will follow the Federal Housing Administration on LinkedIn so that as a community uh, we can stay better connected. We will continue to post updates and information on LinkedIn to ensure our partners and stakeholders are well informed. Again, I want to thank you uh, for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, and have a good day. Well, thank you, Brian, for those great remarks. Um, to further our conversation on FHA, I would like to introduce the senior leadership team at FHA. I'll start with Giselle Roger. She is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Single Family Housing at FHA. We have Keith Becker, who's also Deputy Assistant Secretary and FHA's Chief Risk Officer. And we have Dror Oppenheimer, Senior Advisor to the FHA Commissioner. We would like to go into a little bit more detail about Brian's remarks, um, and we'll get started now. Thank you, guys. You know, I think if we, if we were to distill any key themes that have come out of the past day and a half, it, one that is standing out is simply technology. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of have two different stories going on at HUD. We have, you know, the technology that we've talked about at Ginny Mae, which is our bond administration platform, which is state of the art and remains strong and is secure. Uh, and then we talk about the FHA technology that it was mentioned many times yesterday that is in continual need of improvement. Um, and, it, and I think that's also in stark contrast to how technology has improved in the mortgage industry, particularly around the origination process for borrowers over the past couple of years. Giselle, I'd like to ask you, um, you know, what additional details can you share about the need for FHA's IT modernization in addition to what Brian just shared with us? Sure. Well, I think that when you're thinking about FHA technology, there's one, the aspect of making it easier to do business with FHA. You know, right now, for the 800,000 to a million mortgages that we do at each year in FHA, there's 300 to 400,000 paper case binders that have to be submitted with each of those loans. And that results in slowing down the process for both the lenders and the borrowers. So there's that aspect. And then there's also the aspect of access to credit. 
You know, when we have slow systems, when we don't have that ability to get someone an answer, whether it's a borrower or a lender, about whether or not an FHA um, application meets our guidelines, um, that really hurts our access to credit. So I think that when you're thinking about FHA technology, you really have to think about it, not just from the aspect of the lenders, but I think also in the aspect of access to credit for our borrowers. And the fact that we have this tremendous technological imbalance is really doing a disservice to the communities that we are intended to serve, which is low and moderate income homeowners who overwhelmingly tend to be first time home buyers. I think also when you're talking about technology, you have to talk about and think about FHA's capacity to fulfill its countercyclical role. You know, again, FHA stepped up during the aftermath of the housing crisis, and we provided trillions of dollars worth of mortgage credit in that aftermath. But if we don't have the technology resources to be able to um, have that capacity, to be that counter cyclical source of mortgage credit that again, we are intended to be, then we're going to not be fulfilling our mission. So those, those two key areas of access to credit and, and the capacity to fulfill our counter cyclical role in the mortgage market are, are some additional reasons why this technology is so important. I think in terms of some of the uh, changes that we're looking to do, both from the origination all the way to the claims side, you know, this, this can help all of us in, a tremendous, um, in tremendous ways. I think that in terms of protecting the FHA program from fraud, as well as providing certainty to our lenders before a loan is endorsed, I think is going to be very key. So um, I think the suite of changes that we are working on right now, and we're working in collaboration with FHA's chief information officer are gonna do uh, go a long way in terms of providing that certainty both to the FHA program, which again, it's a 100% taxpayer um, backed program, as well as to our, our lenders. Um, again, we received $20 million in appropriations, but that is a down payment, no pun intended. Um, it is a down payment. We estimate that we would need at least $80 million to make the full suite of changes. And so again, we're gonna continue to work aggressively in showing that FHA can make these changes, that we are going to use the money wisely, that money that's appropriated for single family information technology will only go for single family information technology. Um, but again, this is going to be something where $20 million is not going to just be it. We are going to need the full amount of funding, which we estimate at around $80 million. And then also, we're, we're looking at what other agencies have done, what USDA has done, what VA has done. You know, they have great systems that they have developed. And so our staffs are working together and trying to collaborate. And we're also looking at what the GSEs have done. That's great. I think that's really informational. Uh, if I think about the second main theme for, that's coming out of our session is, you know, how do we combine technology with how we manage the counterparty risks in our program? Keith, if you could, could you talk about how that uh, technology could really help you as you look at single family risk at FHA? Uh, what are today's challenges and where do you see solutions via technology modernization? Sure, thank you. Yeah, and I think you're gonna hear some repeating themes today, technology being one, um, credit risk, credit risk management, and access to credit being another, and, and of course, um, being able to manage the assets once we put them on the books. Um, and as you've been hearing, uh, some of the top risks facing FHA, one of the key ones is technology. Um, we are um, woefully behind um, the industry and our GSE counterparts in technology and, and the use of technology and access to technology. Um, and this has had a dramatic effect on uh, our ability to um, recognize and manage risk up front in the process um, and be able to adequately model um, the risk um, as it works its way through the cycle. Um, and what I want to talk about, this is more than um, keeping up with the GSEs um, in this modern, largely digital, paperless environment. Um, this industry is moving, and if we don't um, keep up with it, it will move past us quickly. Um, and so uh, this is uh, something we need to um, spend more time thinking about how to incorporate in our process. Um, some background, the US residential mortgage industry is experiencing this wave of technological advancement um, with the uh, uh, incorporation and introduction of new risk tools, um, ability to um, get um, income and asset verification um, in a paperless environment, 
um, the ability to at times um, model appraised value um, as a replacement to appraisals. Uh, this is all, um, all happening around us. Um, the GSEs are leveraging this technology now. Um, most of our lender partners are leveraging this technology as well. Uh, we have to find a way to do the same thing so that we can stay um, current with um, industry um, direction. Uh, this will help us um, not only uh, recognize the risk before we actually endorse the loan, potentially giving feedback to lenders uh, prior to endorsement. Um, it can, as Giselle mentioned, be a, a great um, deterrence to fraud by eliminating um, some of the paper that uh, the borrower and other interested parties handle as part of their mortgage underwriting process. Um, and uh, it will uh, permit us to um, be better informed about the risks, not only before we endorse, but as they work their way through the cycle. Uh, a recent Fed study um, that uh, was conducted in 2018 um, analyzed default rates at FHA, uh, with FHA data. And, and this is publicly available data accessed through Neighborhood Watch and, and Ginnie Mae loan level data. And uh, their conclusion is that um, for lenders who, act, who, who leverage and use these FinTech tools that we're talking about, um, both in year one and year two defaults, um, lenders using these tools have a 35% less default rate than lenders who don't use these tools. So the value of these tools is clear. Um, the innovation is, is uh, appropriate for us. And we have to find a better way to, um, to, to be able to leverage that too. Um, think about the reduction in default rate. Um, very important if we can, can uh, continue to support that in the industry. Um, so it doesn't stop there in terms of our ability to, um, to understand and, and model risk as it comes in the door. Um, we have to work internally to ensure that we have access to data, um, both industry data and borrower data, in a fulsome way, uh, and that we use that data um, in our uh, proprietary risk models um, and our other um, internal um, models uh, to improve um, our modeling of risk, our understanding of risk, and um, use that output to drive policy and other risk decisions. Right, and I think what that also creates is an opportunity for us to continue to work together between Ginny May and FHA and ensure that we're all looking at the same data and analyzing risk in a similar fashion. Uh, you know, that only makes it easier for the industry to understand how we're looking at risk, and then they can plan accordingly. Dora, I'd like to turn it to FHA's technology as it relates to servicing. If you could elaborate on kind of, you know, what is it that's needed on the servicing side, particularly, say, around things like loss mitigation, how, what are your thoughts there? So <clears throat> let me start out with acknowledging all of the critical work that servicers do for FHA. We have a lot of interaction with servicers. Uh, we provide the guidelines that servicers use to service our loans. Uh, they provide us data on the status of, of our insured portfolio. And then servicers file claims with FHA to recoup their costs in the default process. Right now, we have 8 million loans that servicers are servicing for us in the insured portfolio. So it's really important that we have a very efficient and effective process to service those loans. The systems that we're using with servicers are at least 30 to 40 years old and are extremely inflexible and require lots of paper documentation and lots of manual workarounds. Let me give you an example. Uh, two weeks after I started uh, at FHA, which was about six months ago, uh, I walked through the claims process with our uh, FHA claims team. Um, as I was walking past uh, the claims area, I, know, I noticed a room with boxes and boxes of paper. So I asked, what, are, what is all this paper and boxes? And I found out that it's the supplemental claims, which are claims that servicers submit uh, uh, for expenses. Um, so my initial reaction is, why can't servicers submit these claims electronically like they do all the other claims? Uh, and the answer is the system is so inflexible that it can only accept one initial claim. So, um, you know, any subsequent claim is, uh, has to come in in paper. So ju just to illustrate the example of how inflexible our system is, 
and how much effort we require from servicers to, uh, you know, to service and file claims on our loans. Uh, our vision for the claim system is to make it fully automated, paperless, minimal exceptions, and that we're uh, paying the claims timely and accurately. You know, if a servicer does a good job servicing our loans, there is no reason to make it difficult on them to collect their claim. So that's one example of, uh, of an area where we can enhance the, cl uh, the claims process. That there are lots and lots of other areas that we're going to pursue. And I think where that also dovetails is into the conversation about banks and non-banks and other participants in the program in government lending in general, because that only adds to the cost of servicing government loans. And we think that, you know, that's something we feedback we get at Ginny. Yes, if we can go after a False Claims Act, but also please work on, you know, the cost of service in the government yep. space. So I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, maybe we can dig in a little bit deeper on race. Keith. You know, FHA has been publicly telling the industry that it has concerns about key risk drivers. This is high DTIs combined with lower credit scores, increase in cash out refis. Um, you know, how, in addition to the idea about the bank versus non-bank dynamic that Brian just spoke about, can you speak to some of the actions that FHA has taken or will be taking to address these risks? Sure. Uh, before I go into that, I'm going to give a little background and context here. Um, the average FHA borrower has um, income, median income, $65,000. Um, the average loan to value is above 95%. Um, the borrower has minimal reserves after closing, one to two months. Um, the average credit score uh, in fiscal year 2018 was 670. That's down from 676 the year before that and is the lowest average credit score since 2008. At the same time, the debt to income ratios have been climbing. Um, the average DTI for a purchase money mortgage last year was uh, just over 43%. Um, in 2018, the average or the uh, uh, debt to income ratio exceeding 50% um, comprised about 25% of the volume. Um, that number continues to grow. Uh, in the second quarter of 2019, nearly 28% of the loans that we're endorsing have debt to income ratios above 50%. That is um, a, a uh, deterioration in credit risk that um, at this point hasn't really abated for, for several years, as you heard uh, the commissioner speak about it earlier as well. Um, and, and these, the reduction in credit scores, the increase in the debt to income ratio uh, is, providing, is proving to be problematic um, in terms of the excessive risk taking and the performance of the, um, the endorsed book. Uh, this is something that we've been um, studying for quite a quite amount of time, and, and we are um, working to uh, develop um, solutions to try and abate this uh, negative trend. Um, we also see uh, this um, concentration of layered risk uh, in um, lower income buckets. Uh, and uh, as you might expect, um, those borrowers who are in lower income buckets typically have less money left over after uh, paying their mortgage payment. Uh, and there are other um, obligations. They've got to pay utilities, gas, groceries, and other things. And so um, we are seeing um, a concentration of underperformance in the lower income buckets um, with excessive risk layering. Uh, cash out refinances. Since 2013, we've seen uh, an increase in um, loans with loan to values greater than 80% and lower credit scores um, in the cash out refinance arena. Uh, and so, as you heard earlier, to begin to address uh, these negative trends, um, we did make a change to our total mortgage uh, scorecard, um, our automated um, underwriting scorecard uh, a few months ago, um, to better address the risk at the margin, um, to make sure that, that, that the uh, loans, um, the last loans coming in um, are still um, of uh, in insurance and, and endorsement quality. Um, we thought at the time that we did it that about four or five percent more loans would go to the refer bucket. And um, so far, um, that's proven to be true and accurate. Um, we are seeing um, roughly four, a little over 4% going to the refer bucket since then. Uh, and that, that means that the lender then, if they wish to continue to um, underwrite and submit that loan for endorsement, they'll have to manually underwrite it. Um, and they will have to um, use um, additional compensating factors that the total scorecard did not already consider when it, when it uh, came up with its referred designation. 
Uh, we also plan to call in these loans um, that are manually underwritten and submitted for endorsement and review them through our quality control process. Um, and we will give lenders feedback um, on uh, where we don't agree with their underwriting decisions. And we'll be able to use this data to um, inform future policy changes as well. Uh, so um, we'll continue to monitor the, this outcome um, to make sure that uh, we continue to, to see a, um, the, the desired effect. Um, and we're prepared to um, continue to make changes um, to the credit policy box to, to uh, address this risk at the margin um, with the goal of, of basically stabilizing um, the, uh, the uh, credit performance trends. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, you know, the commissioner just recently talked about the proposed changes to the loan level and annual lender level certifications, as well as the defect taxonomy mm -hmm. that was posted to the single family housing drafting table. Mm -hmm. Giselle, would you be able to share a little bit more detail about these proposed, proposed revisions? Sure, Marin. So, um, about a month ago, FHA proposed changes to our loan level certification um, form 92900A, as well as our annual lender certification and our quality assurance methodology for individual loans, which we term the defect taxonomy. And the high level goal was to provide additional clarity about what we're looking for in terms of compliance and in terms of certification, transparency, and certainty to lenders that have continued to be part of the FHA program, as well as providing additional certainty for lenders um, that uh, perhaps have taken a pause or left. Um, in terms of the feedback that we're looking for, um, so we posted these on uh, the FHA drafting table. And that's a really elegant tool. It allows us to get a lot of feedback from a variety of stakeholders before we go through the federal register process that we need to use for um, any updates to our certifications. Um, we have uh, closed the process for feedback for the annual lender level certifications. Um, that closed on June 8th. We have extended the feedback period for the, uh, both the loan level certification and for the defect taxonomy. Um, in terms of high level, what we're trying to accomplish, again, with each of these individual um, proposed revisions. So for the annual certifications, we found that uh, we were asking our lenders to certify to more than they were required to certify to in regulation and statute. So we wanted to streamline those certifications. Um, again, sometimes this can be an accretive process where a certification statement can um, take on a lot of bulk, and we wanted to streamline that as much as possible and really be clear about what was important for our lenders to certify to. We're in the process of reviewing those comments right now. For the loan level certifications, it was a similar process. And again, you know, we're very much aware of the fact that the loan level certifications are very key for, for our lenders. Um, you know, it's key for our lenders to um, feel comfortable that they're certifying to um, what they believe they have control over. And so we are going to be looking very, very closely at the feedback that we received. Now, what we put out on the drafting table um, we felt was a good reflection of what we um, need to more adequately manage our risk. But I think, again, we're going to be very open to the feedback that we receive from lenders um, because, again, we want to make sure that we are continuing to have participation in FHA's programs as well as um, for lenders that have stepped away from FHA's programs, particularly from the depository institutions, that they are comfortable with our loan level certifications, that they're comfortable that um, the certifications don't require them to certify to more than they're actually able to reasonably certify to. So we're going to be looking very closely at that, at that feedback. And again, I'd reiterate that for both the annual certifications and the lender level certifications, because these are going to be updated forms, they, there will be a federal register process to, again, provide feedback. But we chose to use the drafting table to try to get as much feedback ex ante before we begin that federal register process. And then finally, for the defect taxonomy, the changes that we made there were, again, to increase our transparency and certainty for our lenders. So for the very first time, we've included potential remedies for given defects. 
We've also updated our severity tiers and we've included a new servicing section in the defect taxonomy. So again, this is all with the goal of increasing transparency about what we're looking for when it comes to compliance in the FHA program. Thanks, Giselle. Drawer, um, like we just touched on, uh, some in the industry argue that servicing an FHA portfolio is more complex and thereby more costly um, than servicing a conventional portfolio. Can you speak to this and some of the actions that we're considering in FHA to make servicing of FHA portfolios a little bit easier? Sure. <clears throat> the characteristics, there's no question there were characteristics of the FHA loans require, you know, I would say, heightened uh, uh, attention from servicers compared to the more balanced GSC portfolios. There's no question. It takes work to service an FHA portfolio, and we recognize that. Over the last three months, um, we've engaged many servicers in many different forms to get their feedback about how we can make the servicing process more effective and efficient for borrowers and servicers. You know, from all of those discussions, we have a very good understanding of the key pain points that servicers experience. And this is end to end, the servicing process, loss mitigation, disposition, conveyance, the entire process. So we have a good understanding of the key pain points. And through our modernization effort, we're going to address those key pain points, or we're going to try as many as we can and as quickly as we can to address those key pain points, especially the ones that result in positive outcomes to the borrowers, FHA borrowers, and taxpayers. Right. Now, I will say, being new to FHA, doing this in the government is sometimes a little harder than I expected, but I will tell you that we're very committed to getting this done and getting this done as quickly as possible. That's great, and I think you know, across the board, interests are aligned on those efforts. You know, it's great for the taxpayer, it's great for Ginny, it's great for FHA, and probably most importantly, it's great for the borrower. So it, it, that work makes perfect sense. As a follow-up to that, could you give us some insight to where you see the biggest opportunities for process improvement for things like loss mitigation and the policies and processes around that? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we, went, we looked end-to-end -end at all of the processes, and let me touch on a few that we're going to hit on uh, quickly. First one is the one you mentioned, is the loss mitigation process. We want to streamline the loss mitigation process in order to make it as easy as possible to keep people in homes while ensuring that we're protecting taxpayers. Um, we will try as much as we can, and I think Commissioner Montgomery hit on this, to use some of the work and to try to standardize our processes to be as consistent as we can with the GSCs, um, and, and that's to, uh, as it makes sense to FHA. Let me give you a, an example of where it, that could work. Um, it, in the loss mitigation application, we require a tremendous amount of documentation, and it's much more than the GSCs require. That's an area that I think we're going to look at and, and see how do we streamline the application process, because this is a time when we need to speed up the process, not slow it down. So that's an example in the, in the loss mitigation area that we're going to pursue. Um, <clears throat> another area that we're going to pursue is alternatives to conveyance. Conveyance is when a servicer um, uh, conveys or uh, assigns a property to FHA after default. Uh, that process is very cumbersome for, for servicers. It's the most costly for servicers and FHA. Um, what we've done over the last few years uh, is move to alternatives to conveyance. So uh, an example is what we call the 
claims without conveyance process. And over the last two or three years, that process, is, uh, we've increased the number of dispositions to 70% of our total from about 20% about five years ago. So right now, that's the predominant disposition process for, uh, for defaulted loans. That process is so much easier for servicers and is less costly for taxpayers. So that's definitely an area that we're going to continue to increase in order to uh, minimize the effort for servicers and reduce losses for FHA. Uh, a third area I think uh, uh, Giselle touched on it earlier is uh, the file submission process. I was recently in our Philadelphia home, uh, home ownership center and I mean the stacks of files is, is incredible and it, it just so in, in this day and age it's so much easier to get those files electronically as Keith mentioned really get the data so we can use the data uh, to better manage our portfolio. So those are examples of areas that we can move on, you know, hopefully move on fairly quickly. But as I mentioned, there, we're going to look at it end to end. And, uh, and there are lots of other areas of improvement as well. Thanks, Keith. Drawer. Um, over the past six months, you know, Giselle, you and your team have been incredibly busy and have published a series of mortgagee letters. Mm -hmm. You know, that, the idea behind them, it seems as though it's really to, the intention is to make business, make it easier to do business mm -hmm. with FHA. Can you give us an update on the changes you've made so far and any progress reports you have coming out of those changes? Sure, so we have made a number of changes, Marin. Thank you for, for recognizing that. Um, a couple of those changes include um, efforts to reduce some of our regulatory burden. So this is an overall goal of the administration, but this is also a goal for us to, again, make it easier to do business and um, make it easier for our borrowers to access FHA credit. So some of the things that we've done include having a mortgagee letter, putting forward a mortgagee letter that authorizes the use of third-party verification services. And this is important because, again, this is helping us take a step towards the 21st century here where you know, instead of requiring borrowers and their lenders to submit you know, PDF forms, which can be subject to all sorts of fraud and manual manipulation, allowing the use of third-party verification services, which is something that many lenders are already using and is you know, very rapidly becoming a standard in industry practice, is again going to help protect the program, but also help um, make it easier and make that whole underwriting process a little bit more swifter. Um, in terms of reducing regulatory burden, one thing that we did was in light of the issues that we have with new um, entry level housing supply, um, we removed some of the burdens associated with loans for newly constructed properties. So we removed the inspector roster requirement and the 10 year warranty requirement for newly constructed homes. Um, in terms of other things that we're doing, I described the updates to certifications and defect taxonomy. Um, one of the major updates that we've done is we have, for the first time since 2016, put out a new iteration of FHA's single family housing handbook. And this is something that our lenders use. It's much easier to understand specifically what FHA's policies are when they're all combined and collated into an edition of the handbook versus trying to reference various mortgagee letters and regulations. So we put out a new iteration of the single family handbook in March, and we plan on being on a quarterly schedule to update, um, to release new updates of the handbook. Um, some innovations that we put into the latest iteration of the handbook include um, clarifying our guidance on co-borrowers and which co-borrowers can um, participate in the FHA program if they have an existing FHA loan. Um, we also clarified uh, gift documentation requirements um, to, again, make it clearer that if you're a borrower and you're receiving uh, a gift documentation, how exactly how you're receiving a gift, how exactly that needs to be documented. Um, 
Currently, we're looking at making some updates to the handbook in the areas of servicing, as well as um, our Title I manufactured home loans. So this is all um, efforts that we're trying to do to, again, make it easier to do business with us, make it easier to understand what our requirements are. Um, and as um, Keith mentioned, um, you know, we put out an FHA info guide uh, notice um, to make clear that we were looking at our underwriting practices and we were making changes to the total mortgage scorecard. Um, looking forward, um, again, as we've uh, noted in our FHA annual reports in 2017 and 2018, we're looking very closely at um, the prevalence of cash out refinances and also as the commissioner mentioned and has been mentioned in our uh, 2017 and 2018 annual reports to Congress, we're looking closely at the use of down payment assistance. Thanks, Giselle. We have one last question for Keith. Uh, you've given several interviews where you've spoken about risk layering and what per some perceive as the deteriorating credit risk of the FHA single family portfolio. Can you explain to us why that is such a concern uh, in addition to the comments you made earlier, especially when our mission is to serve those under bar underserved borrowers versus the conventional market? Sure, thank you. And this really is a continuation of my previous remarks. Uh, we must balance our mission of uh, helping first time home buyers, minority families, and other credit qualified borrowers, um, as well as provide a source of counter, -cyclic counter cyclical liquidity to the mortgage market, uh, with the responsibility also to maintain adequate claims paying abilities. Um, simple task, right? Yeah. With our current forward book uh, performances strong, um, as you've heard, and, and again to repeat the, the theme, we are seeing increasing risk at the margin. We've seen this for um, some time now. And uh, that poses um, risk to the future. Um, these lower credit scores, the higher debt to income ratios, um, the higher LTV cash out refinances, and the increasing use of riskier forms of down payment assistance um, all provide um, a little stress to the uh, performance of the um, portfolio. So uh, it is important to balance our mission and taxpayer protection obligations um, and make sure that we do not contribute to uh, extension of credit to over-levered borrowers um, who will struggle to be successful homeowners. Uh, to bring this full circle, um, and I'm gonna go back and talk about our access to technology and, and, and risk tools. Um, this will help us achieve this balance um, to better uh, provide um, mission support and manage the risk that, that we are endorsing um, in our um, current book and in the portfolio. Um, for example, uh, go back to the, um, the idea of the risk tools where you can get automated um, income and um, asset information. Mm -hmm. uh, Im imagine a world, and this, this technology exists today, um, where you can um, get bank statements in an automated fashion, um, let's say over a period of 12 months, um, and you can see all the income deposits from paychecks and other sources of income, and you can see um, the outflow of cash in terms of supporting all the monthly obligations. Um, and we can use that to model um, a borrower's um, both cash inflow and cash outflow um, to give a better sense for what their true income and what their true obligations are. Um, in this sense, um, we would be able to expand our policies to serve um, the less traditional borrower uh, who maybe is relying um, more on um, multiple sources of income, potentially uh, multiple household um, income, um, in addition to just their standard paycheck with a W-2. Um, and we can get a better feel for the um, obligations that, that they're um, servicing too. And we can use that to adjust our policies, to be able to expand um, our ability to serve um, the mission in that sense, and still uh, be very informed on the risks that we're taking um, and, and make sure that that uh, fits within our, um, our credit appetite. That's right. And I think, you know, as it relates to all the work that both of our offices are doing on risk, it's great to have such great partners on the FHA side. You know, it's clear that we're managing our business today and understanding that the economy has been so strong, we want to be prepared for if and when that changes. So I think, you know, the more that we do together, that will make all the difference in the world for the future when the economy isn't as strong as it is today. I thank you guys very much for your time um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.